And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, one half of the Menzies Brothers of Parable Games. Coming previously on here for things like Shiver and Don't Play This Game. Although you really should. And now coming back with a mech the with a mech themed solo RPG known as Ion Heart. The one and only Barney Menzies. How you doing today, man? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me back in the monastery. Mm -hmm. Thank you for thank you for coming for coming back. So this is your second solo RPG. I suppose, I suppose the first place to start is where the idea for a post-war mech exploration um, solo RPG came. Yeah, sure. So um, Ben, who was the, the lead artist on Shiver, had in his sort of spare time got really into the, the mech genre uh, playing a lot of video games, watching a lot of anime, and he'd been doodling away and coming up with this this world um, and these sort of mech designs as a, a, a hobby project. Um, and we he showed it to me and Charlie one day, and we were talking about how interesting it would be to tell stories in a world where you have all of these big weapons of war, but there's not really much fighting going on. And obviously the way that he, that idea kind of sprung from the way that he'd drawn these big robots with the lovely pastel colors and big round edges, giving us like the big hero six, iron giant, like big friendly robot vibes. Um, and that, that kind of span out into, well, there's a lot of stuff out there for people who want to play big, punchy mech stories, but there's not maybe anything out there, really, for people who want to play something that's a bit lighter or more relaxed. Now, I've I've talked about the whole Appendix N concept, so what sort of media would you say served as inspiration for Ion Heart? So it's, I think it's definitely a mixture. Um there's there's a good deal of um that kind of um i guess you could call it something like companion fiction um that iron giant being like one of the big ones that we've got as a as a reference point for what we're working on as like this big friendly thing um that your your main character is helping to show the world um and that that is kind of the crux of how we've designed a lot of the narrative is this idea that your robot and your pilot are linked together and your pilot is showing the robot what what the world can be like outside of the war. Um, but then we've got all of these other elements as well that we're drawing for from, from a more broader sci-fi perspective, um, things like mass effect or like twilight imperium like this idea of sort of animal themed races and planetary exploration um side missions galore um and the trying to get that sort of high sci-fi feeling of the wonder of space and then combine it with that kind of ambling journey um, not quite sort of body cop style story, but more like um, Lone Wolf and Cub or like uh, stories where you have like one character who's taking another character with them as a lens to reveal the world. Yeah. I suppose, I suppose something like Big Friendly Giant could also um, be... Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was another one that we, we talked quite a lot about. Um, is that yeah? That has a very similar thing of, um, but it, that that one's very interesting as well because it's a it's a multi directional story because you have the portion of the story where 
she is teaching the giant about the human world, but then you go to the other side of the curtain as well, and the giant is teaching her about the giant world. And so there, there, there are definitely some interesting parallels there. But also we have this huge litany of, of mech fiction as Um, setting, mm-hmm. yeah, and give, now given the fact that the exploration loop that you re- you bring up in the quick start has you built has you building planets and settlements, uh, is there the impl- is there the implication that one could that one could do ion iron hard across multiple planets? And if if so, in universe, how would you ha- how would you handle travel between planets with you and the mech? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you create your first planet that you visit to, um, the first settlement you create has to have a spaceport of some kind, and that could be everything from a, a backwater gas station, interplanetary gas station, to a, a huge spaceport in a metropolis. And the idea is that you can you go and you go to a planet and you start your adventure. And then depending on where your story takes you, perhaps you spend a long time exploring that one planet before you want to move on. Or perhaps you arrive um, and you, you, you engage with a singular shorter story and then you perhaps your story takes you to another planet. And the idea is that not only will you have some storytelling elements within the planets themselves, but also the moving between those planets and the people that you meet as you're doing that will also become part of your story. And that's something that's not really featured in the demo. Um, but this idea that there's there are hugely different ways that you can travel between planets as well, because say you're in a, a singular solar system where all of your planets are quite close together, the way that you're making your journeys between those planets is going to be very different to say if you're getting on a... a a massive transport hauler and getting in a, a snap rift and moving from one solar system to another and moving from different areas of the, the galaxy. So those kind of different journeys, I think, will provide some interesting narrative possibilities for friends your characters can meet and sort of different constraints for the story. Um, but also, if you were to just create one humongous planet and explore it, you could also do that with the way that the story loop is designed. Um, and similarly with the the story circuits, we're making sure that those can be applied to as many planets as possible to make sure that, that you can weave those narratives into different places so that you're not locked out of your circus story, even if you're on an ice planet or however you're kind of putting those creative elements together. Mm-hmm. And with that, now with that in mind, I believe with the setup that you have, that you have, you're using, you're using a D or using a D six approach with four, with four and up as successes for how mm-hmm. things are going to work. Yeah, so the, 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 the thing that we wanted to do mechanically with the system was keep it really simple um, because we knew that much like our, our other games, a lot of the people that are coming to play the games that Parable makes are entry-level gamers that maybe have never played a role-playing game before. Maybe they've played a board game or maybe even don't really have any history at all with tabletop gaming. And so what we wanted to do was design the experience from a narrative perspective first and then layer mechanics on top of that that would would be easy to understand for somebody who's maybe not not interacted with role-playing games before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think what I think one of the things that is going to is going to be dif- different from the way a lot of people see a mech story is there seems to be this implication from what I from what I was reading that the mechs and Ironheart are I guess semi sentient would that be accurate? 
Yeah, so the the idea is that the 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 mechs are powered by a machine called the Ion Core. Uh, and what that is is a is, is an artificial intelligence um that um allows the mechs to um perform more difficult tasks that they wouldn't be able to do if they were just simply being piloted by a human. Um, but the interesting thing about that technology is that it only works properly when that mech bonds with a person. And so the idea is that as your pilot and your mech bond together, uh, the ion core of, the, of your mech will grow and learn more things. But it, not only will it learn things from its experiences with you, but it will also unlock memories of any of its past pilots mm -hmm. so there's this theme that will run throughout the your stories where you'll be able to uncover kind of the things that your mech has gone through up until this point and that that gets really interesting when you dig into things like the different alien species within the setting and them having different lifespans so say for example the the Apollonians in the setting have a, a human st uh, length lifespan. And so they're probably one to two generations deep into their mechs being inherited after the big war that's finished. And so you could be piloting your mech and finding about, about your grandfather's war stories or what they did after the war, whilst some of the longer lived species could still be the pilots from the war originally. And so that, that provides a really interesting storytelling dynamic there. I can, now with that, in, with that in mind, given that each of the origins for your pilot um, seem to com come from, di come from different regions, that brings me to a question regarding the AU. Is the is the Astral Union a, ca a case where you have a bunch of se um, semi -auto semi autonomous um, factions that are part of a collective whole? Oh. Yeah. So the the way we the way we describe it in the book is a is a conglomeration of cultures, and it's 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 kind of born out of this idea that um, previously. Before there was a unifying threat to the the galaxy, there these cultures had quite fractious uh, and sometimes conflicting relationships. And what the 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 Great War that this uh, the setting is um, placed seventy years after is d looking at is well, once once the war is over, we have this the building blocks of this great piece and a lot of the story is looking into well how do you how do you maintain that piece what threats are there to the piece and also what is it that would perhaps instigate conflict between the various cultures and we're it's something that in the in the core book we're focusing more on the the established piece but for example, in Remembrance, which is the the supplement book that we're releasing alongside the Pilot's Handbook, mm -hmm. um, that is set in a in the solar system where one of the the large battles at the end of the war happens. Um, but the culture of um, aliens that inhabits it um, are currently not part of the AU for a number of different sort of political reasons because. AU is now so vast and sprawling that there's lots of lots of different cultures that want to join it, and it it allows um, players to kind of explore how how that might work um, within the the setting um, and 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 explore those kind of ideas as well. But yeah, the the idea is that it's it's a rather than being a um, a singular government where everyone has kind of been forced together it's it's much more mm, not not federal but certainly like yeah a collection of almost like a collection of city states but with solar systems and, and maybe larger territories as well because 
some of the some of the cultures are spanning multiple solar systems whilst whilst others are only contained to to one the way you describe it it i know it would be tempting to compare this to the U, to say the un or something like that but i and i end up thinking of the giant herding of cats that was the holy roman empire yeah i mean i i i i I think it's it's something that is referenced quite a lot in science fiction writing. This idea of a external threat to um, a, a a combined civilization that brings together um, people over say established differences. Um, one of the one of the, the the movies that I kind of think about is. Things like um, the movie Independence Day, mm-hmm. not particularly great from a like we're looking at the peaceful setting idea, but the idea of this like cross country collaboration against a singular threat to human existence. Mm-hmm. But in this, we're expanding that idea from human existence to sentient life within within the galaxy that the AU exists in. Yeah. Well, teamwork is essential. It gives people other things to shoot at. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to when it comes to Max, I noticed that you guys had a bit of a goal of tr- of showing a wide ver- a wide variety. Some are the standard bipedal, some are qu- are quadrupeds. Uh, though with the though there is the issue of size, since depending on Depending on the max story in question, the size the size of max can range from from just twenty five feet to eighty feet to somewhere in between or even bigger than that. Huh. If you had to if you if you had to use a parallel, what what would you what would you say would be a parallel as far as the comparative size of the max and ion heart to say max and other media? So. Mechs in Ironheart are are pretty wide ranging. Um, generally speaking, your significantly larger mechs are much less common. Um, <clears throat> there 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 were a lot of larger mechs during the war, due to the the nature of that war and the things that they were fighting. The the there was a need for some of those larger mechs. But generally, there aren't because the mechs are now being repurposed to more sort of civilian practical purposes. The need for a mech that can punch an alien the size of a city is is not really a relevant role. So you will have some mechs still in operation that are very large that are say helping spaceships dock that are huge or maybe doing humongous feats of construction that you could only do with a larger mech but then most of the mechs that are still operating and have been repurposed are going to be of a much more reasonable civilian size so you're looking at stuff that's going to be the size of larger vehicles, probably a little bit bigger than what we would think of for like vehicles we we use. So the size on of Earth. construction vehicles. Yeah, so I think some of your smaller mechs are, are around that size because obviously you've still got to have pilots be able to fit within them. Um, but then you will have some of the some significantly larger mechs that are probably the size of say like. Uh, like uh, passenger aircraft or, or things of that nature, yeah. where they are bigger, but they're still within the, the the realms that they could move through a large settlement easily or travel on a road, because those are going to be the things that constrain the movement and operation of mechs outside of, say, a specialised area like a, a a mineral mine or a construction site. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that that? That an average size mech would be akin to, say the, say the, um, Votoms in terms of size. 
Yeah, I, so I think like the most most of the mechs you're going to find are going to be the size of like a, a large a large van, maybe slightly larger, somewhere between like a, a van and a and a and a, a lorry, because you're 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 kind of in that slightly larger than your average say transformer because you've got to have people inside it but beyond that like yeah it's it's mm-hmm. it's gonna be your yeah all the one-man operations that are being used for things like farming or carrying a a, a load of post from one settlement to the other the things that are, are going to be used in day-to-day operations of people's normal lives are the things that the, the mechs are going to be best suited for but I mean, like one of my favorite illustrations that we have in the the demo of the game is the uh, the illustration of the mech circus being moved from one settlement to another, and in that you get a really good sense of like the different sizes that mechs can be because you've got kind of much smaller mechs that would maybe be performing in the circus that are that kind of human vehicle size, but then in the background of that you have a huge quadrupedal mech that has all of the baggage and the big top ready to be set up that maybe wouldn't wander into the settlement they're going into and would remain on the edge and that that's kind of your, your division mm-hmm. yeah i can i can certainly get that and with now with that in in my in mind it is it is interesting that you guys are going going with a leveling system when it comes to adva- when it comes to advancement instead of something freeform. Uh, what prompted that? What prompted that particular decision? Just simplicity. So the the interestingly the leveling system in the demo is actually going to be changing. We're gonna be we're gonna be altering that to fit much more with the storytelling element of. Um, the setting and this idea of like the advancing bond of the your pilot and mech together mm-hmm. and so those uh the, your level up procedure will be much more tied to how much has the partnership of your pilot and mech progressed and then how much of that um translated into say your mech's ability to do more things or unlock new skills because we really like this idea of like oh we've bonded over doing this this thing together and now my mech has remembered a skill from its past life that we can then use together and that and that's what the leveling up system is going to be focused on it's just something that we didn't include in the demo because it's it's quite complicated and doesn't doesn't fit very easily in a in a shorter version of the game so we just wanted to provide that basic leveling system as a uh, as an idea that the mechs are going to level up as are your pilots but it's it's going to be in a in a, a much more narrative focused way all right i i can get that now when it comes to when it comes to combat uh i think the big the big thing that I was cu- that I was curious about is the description of essentially essentially tracks. Oh, since it's it's very di- it would be very difficult to do combat in the traditional sense when you're doing a solo game. So mm-hmm. how how do you make how do you make sure that there's still there's still a means of engaging with with the mechanics in combat for this sort of experience because obviously the last the last solo game that you and i talked about combat wasn't really going to be a thing because of the subject matter yes yeah yeah well, i mean, I mean in, in don't play this game we we handled it more as a a skill challenge idea rather than say combat because the any fight that you would get into ultimately you wouldn't win uh, um, so uh, and 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 similarly with iron heart there's there's a focus that is heavily geared towards this idea of when the the possibility of combat presents itself it's it's just as much about the decision of how you're going to engage with that combat as it is about the actual fight itself so for example 
there's always an option for you to try and take a peaceful resolution, be that talk down the person that's trying to get into conflict with, conflict with you, um, run away from the conflict, or try and subdue the person who is who is coming into conflict conflict with you in a in a way that isn't harmful. And that's something that we we're going to focus a bit more on as we expand those those rules for how conflict encounters work. Um, as far as the the actual um, mechanics of getting into fights and such, what we are trying to do is when you're entering a combat encounter, you should have already, to some extent, built up an idea of what this thing is that you're you're coming into conflict with. Conflict encounters, although they have obviously these combat stages and roles, are much more about what the combat is doing for the overall narrative than it is for the actual combat. So, for example, we've had people posting in our Discord some some sort of logs from their pilot about the journeys that they've been on. We had quite a few people who are oh, my character has run away from their previous life. Um, perhaps they were a smuggler or um, maybe worked with a band of mercenaries and they wanted to get away from that life and live more peacefully. Uh, and so when they run into a, a random encounter as they travel between settlements and it's like, oh, two, two of these types of mech have shown up on your road and they they have a they have a reason for conflict with you a lot of that setup is going to be well why do they have a reason for conflict with you and you as the player in your your narrative creation you've got to work out what that is so a lot of those players who say were running away from their past life when they're encountering mechs on the road it's oh well these are two people that have been sent by the smuggler king that i was working for that are trying to bring me back or um, perhaps the, these are yeah enforcers of my parents that want to bring me back to uh, uh, to the my family obligations that I don't want to return to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, that, and now with that with that kind of thing in mind, the en- the enemies that were in the demo were were mostly uh, mechs. With, in the full book, are there? Other types of other types of threats like local wildlife that might show up. Yes, so so there there, there are there are going to be a, a a wide variety of threats that you could run into. It's not just going to be robots punching robots, because um, there'll be a lot of exploring. Um, yeah, kind of lo- like we want to explore local flora and fauna because what we will will want to do is allow players the creative space to add to those planetary biomes and and expand the worlds that they're playing in so if you've got ideas for an alien creature that you'd like to exist on this world as you're exploring then then you can create that within the bounds of the system much in the same way that a lot of our games are are designed with that framework in mind that we'll provide you with some of our set examples, but we also want to provide players with that framework to be like, okay, um, this is roughly what a a medium threat combat encounter would look like. And so you can then shape that yourself to be like, okay, well, I've run into a a five-legged dinosaur on this desert planet, and and I'm going to build that out with the threat level that I think it would be. Now, obviously, a big part of the narrative loop is the story circuit, and there's a couple examples in the quick start. Within the full book, do you pl- do you plan on putting guidance as far as how how to structure the story circuit if somebody wanted to write their own circuits? Yeah, absolutely. So similar to as I was saying, the sort of being able to design your own uh threats and combat encounters with the designing your own story circuits is something that we really want to encourage people to think about and it's really the the structure that we have for that with the five acts of which you need to complete three and then a finale makes a really nice nice build-up point and a really easy way for people who maybe 
haven't written much in the way of narrative fiction before to create stories that they'd understand from from popular fiction. So yeah, well, that's definitely something we want to encourage beyond the the story circuits that we'll be including in the book, because obviously there'll be more than the the two of, that the demo has. Um, we'll also have some story circuits that play with that story circuit mechanic a little bit and work out like give some examples of how you could build variation into them and tweak with that mechanic a little bit to make the stories uh, operate in interesting ways. Mm-hmm. That, cer- that certainly fits. So with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a page count for the book? So the, the core book is looking to be about 160-ish pages. Um, obviously, we're, we're adding some stretch goals and we're having uh, guest writers join us for some some of the bits of the book so it's going to be up or down but that's roughly where we're estimating it to be um but as with all of our books uh, i always caveat it with we we want to make books that are and games that are good and the fullest extent of the thing that they are trying to be so that means that we have to make a bigger book to get everything in that we want to be within the game then that's absolutely what we'll do mm-hmm. yeah that's that certainly makes sense and as far as a release window what would you be shooting for so currently we're looking to fulfill this for uh crowdfunding backers mm-hmm. in the summer um so it will probably be june july for uh, backers, and then it will be out sort of end of July, August to uh, retail as well. Mm-hmm. It's a, it has a nice it has a nice sort of summery feel to it. So it, it's something that we thought would be nice for people on their their summer breaks and things to to enjoy with a, a drink in the sunshine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So with that said, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops, but. I do want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come back to the temple and enjoy the madness of time zones to to return. <laughs> oh. No, thank you, thank you very much for having me. And it's yeah, it's it's always nice to sort of dig into the the weeds a little bit on on what we're doing and, and share everything with everybody. Yeah, oh. and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. And yes, yeah. So I think I, th- I think after we've we've finished this uh this this crowdfunding period, we will all be deserving of a, a of a nice long beverage. Yeah, a a pint or two, as it were. Oh. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!